It's a pleasure to, to have Luis Salo today uh, to give the seminar of the Hydrogeology Group. Um, Luis did the master thesis at the UPC in the Civil Engineering School, and, and he did it. Uh, uh, he was studying the potential causes of the induced seismicity at Castor. And this is how we got to know him uh, in the hydrogeology group because of his paper related to, to the Castor earthquakes. And after that, he moved to MIT where he is doing the PhD with, with Ruben Juanes. Uh, we know Ruben from a long time ago. Actually, he was he gave a seminar more than 10 years ago here in the group. And uh, Luis will talk about his research today and related to the, th the thesis. It's worth mentioning that he has been awarded a MathWorth Engineering Fellowship and also a post um, postgraduate fellowship from, from La Casa, which are very prestigious and very difficult fellowships to get. So, Luis, uh, the floor is yours. And we will be happy to, to learn about your research. Thank you, Victor. All right, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Solo. Uh, I'm a PhD student with uh, Ruben Juanes at MIT. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I want to say thanks, first of all, to both Victor and, and Martin for organizing this seminar, for giving me the, the opportunity to talk to you about my work today. Um, and, uh, well, we thought that we would do this seminar in English to facilitate participation by, by international researchers here at UPC. So um, hopefully that's going to be the best, the best option. Um, so as I said, uh, my name is Luis, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, some of the work that I've done over my PhD. Uh, the topic is uh, fault hazards during larger scale geologic carbon storage in extensional silicyclastic basins. This work we have done in collaboration with uh, Josimar, who is, uh, well, was a PhD student with Ruben and then a postdoc, and also in collaboration with ExxonMobil, um, who have been collaboration, collaborating with us uh, throughout uh, most of my PhD, actually. So currently I'm towards the end of my PhD and hoping to graduate by next year, if I do everything that I have to do. So. Um, all right, so today what I'll do is, first of all, I will introduce the topic of uh, CO2 storage and its importance in the context of the energy transition. I will also use this first part of motivation to introduce two of the hazards that we've been looking at in the context of CO2 storage. One is the question of potential leakage of CO2 through geological faults, and the other is a well-known hazard and one that uh, also your group is studying, which is the, the question of induced seismicity and the potential reactivation of faults as a result of the increase in pressure due to CO2 injection. So uh, after this uh, introduction, I will talk about two uh, projects more in detail. The first one is a project that is part of my PhD thesis. And uh, here what we're trying to do is to uh, quantify the permeability of uh, geologic faults in a specific type of setting that I will introduce. Uh, and we do that via uh, stochastic modeling. And then the, the final project that I will detail today um, has by, or, or the main goal is to assess the viability of industrial scale CO2 storage. By industrial scale, what I mean is megaton uh, per year per field, which is what's going to allow us to sort of ramp up the, the storage capacity to the gigaton scale globally, which is what we need to sort of offset the current level of CO2 emissions. So, uh, with that in mind, um, well, as many of you probably will know, the IPCC is uh, currently in its sixth uh, assessment cycle, and recently it reported that if we are to have a shot at limiting global warming to 1.5 or 2 uh, degrees Celsius um, above the industrial levels, the CO2 emissions need to peak this decade. Um, this comes at the same time where we're still using globally about 80% of uh, fossil fuels to provide, so about 80% of our primary energy still comes from burning fossil fuels in the form of coal, oil, or gas. So this is the first context where CO2 storage as a technology over the next few decades can really provide um, a lot of value and help us complete this energy transition 
um, as we move on to these uh, more renewable and um, cleaner uh, energy sources. And then uh, CO2 storage is also an integral part of a set of technologies typically referred to as negative emission technologies. These include technologies such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or direct air capture plus storage. Um, in order for these technologies to really work at the scale that we need them to, to make a dent on current CO2 emissions, we need to be able to dispose of the CO2. And that's where uh, CO2 storage also comes into play. So then, um, with that in mind, uh, there are two sort of problems, issues, hazards that are that have been highlighted in, in relation to geologic faults that um, need to be well known and well studied in order to for successful uh, CO2 storage. The first one is the question of potential fluid migration through uh, geologic faults. Uh, here you have an example, both this uh, block diagram and then this, this picture of a well-known example in, in Utah. It's a uh, crystal geyser. There's a set of uh, fault zones that have been identified and there's multiple leaks of CO2 in, in this area. Um, that have been interpreted both by indirect and more direct observations to come, or this migration is facilitated by these geological faults. So essentially the message here is that even before we introduce any perturbation in the system due to our injection, we need to be able to identify which faults will be problematic, and so they have a set of properties that will allow fluids, particularly CO, free phase CO2, but also in some cases brine with dissolved CO2, to migrate through them, and which ones will not. Um, in some cases, this is very clear due to the previous history of a given field and so on, but in some other cases, it's not that clear. And given the expanse in, in terms of uh, uh, new storage capacity that we will need, it's an important question to really be able to solve. Um, the second one is the question of potential fault reactivation due to, a, due to the increase in, in pore pressure as a result of the, of the injection. So this is a topic that has been studied, uh, well, uh, already coming from, from a few decades. I think that the first experiments of induced uh, sleep in faults were in the 70s. But more recently, in the last two decades, this has been, or has been researched uh, much more in, in the context of different energy technologies. Um, in order to understand why uh, an increasing pore pressure triggers or may trigger seismic activity, we need to understand the concept of effective stress, which probably most of you are very familiar with. Um, the idea is that, well, when we increase this pore pressure uh, in using a positive compression um, sign convention, the effective stress will diminish, and because the frictional strength of a fault depends, among other things, on the effective stress, that can bring a fault that is hydraulically connected to a given reservoir closer to failure. Um, of course, it's not that simple. Due to this injection, the expansion of the pore elastic matrix will also cause changes in the total stresses, and so it's the balance between the two that will determine whether one fault is closer to uh, failing or not. Um, so, of course, I cannot introduce this topic without mentioning the, ca the case of the Castor underground gas storage, which uh, generated or where a set of earthquakes, I think still today, maybe they are the largest magnitude earthquakes associated to under underground gas storage. In this case, it was for natural gas, but I mean, the physics are similar to situ storage. And um, this is a case that, well, I had the the opportunity to study during my master's thesis, and then there's been more works in the topic, uh, including several works by, by your group, um, that have uh, continued to investigate the potential causes of reactivation in this case. And uh, for those of you that may, be, that may be interested in learning more about the triggering mechanisms, there is this uh, recent review, um, also by the UPCSC uh, group, that uh, sort of uh, provides uh, an explanation and, and details in the context of geology carbon storage. All right, so with this introduction, um, now we are ready to sort of dig, dig into the, the two projects that I wanted to talk about. Um, so the first one, as I mentioned earlier, is in the context of quantifying fault permeability. Um, and we do that through a modeling or a, a stochastic model that sort of tries to incorporate the effect of clay smears, which are the product of the formation of clay-rich layers in the stratigraphy into the fault, and we try to account for these materials and then um, quantify their influence in terms of how they change the fault permeability. So what we did here was uh, develop a new method that is tailored to these uh, settings that I sort of introduced at the beginning, but we will talk about it more in detail now. 
So these are poorly modified soliciclastic sequences, sequences in which, in which you have alternates of sands and clays. Um, the output of this, of this uh, method is a probability distribution. It's not a specific value of permeability because we have quite a bit of uncertainty in quantifying this, this parameter. So we try to um, quantify that uncertainty and give, uh, give uh, well, uh, a view of, of how much uncertainty we have. And then the other particularity of this algorithm, in particular for uh, people that may want to use or may want to know a probability for later using reservoir simulation in fluid flow simulations, is that um, the user can define the resolution that they want um, in terms of probability. For example, do you have like five cells, three cells, or ten cells along this given interval? Um, and then the algorithm outputs the probability at that resolution, which is useful for later simulation. So what I will show, um, what we observe is that um, in some cases the full probability distributions can be multimodal because some arrangement of materials will lead to holes in these clay smears and some others will not. And then due to the arrangement of these materials, we can have an isotropy in the probability of several orders of magnitude. Um, and the conclusion or the take-home message of this sort of work is that we are able to quantify the likelihood of different full probability scenarios, which is something required to assess hazard in in technologies like CO2 storage. All right, so how did we do this? Well, so the first thing uh, that I want to mention is that we focused on these uh, soft, water uh, liquefied siliciclastic basins in which uh, the sediments have not yet completed their transition to rocks. These are typically young basins at depths of less than two or three kilometers of depth. And it's been studied that their rheological properties allow them to undergo, in general, uh, larger deformations without, or in a more ductile way, so without an associated uh, hazard of, of potential induced seismicity and as a, as a result of potential leakage when compared to rocks that are more um, more stiff and, and uh, more, more brittle, like the ones that we find in the basin. So, uh, okay, this is the PDF. Okay, so this was a small video based on sandbox models at uh, Aachen University in Germany. Uh, where they, they have a set of like experiments where they have an alternate of sand layers and clay layers and then they deform these using a, a basal uh, metallic plate that can be displaced um, and so that you can generate faults in the, in the overlying units. And um, this was to illustrate that in these faults it is the, or the clay layers are sort of dragged into the fault zone and then it is the the proportion and the continuity of these layers, which in the fault, not this product of formation, is what we call the clay smears, that determine the, the permeability and the conductivity of these fault zones. So this is what we're going to try to represent in this method. And um, by doing that, we get a better representation of fault permeability. And uh, well, why did we do that? So the I mean, of course, we did the background research initially, and what we found is that in this type of sequences, the sort of uh, um, method that is more widely used, that comes from the, or was devised in collaboration report for the oil industry, is um, a method that is sort of depicted here. So the idea is that you model a, a proxy property, such as the shale gauss ratio. maybe some of you are familiar with it, maybe some others are not. This is simply a sort of weighted average of the clay fraction that has a slip past a given point. So you have the clay fraction that each layer in the stability has and then their thicknesses and you can compute an average value based on that. You can map that on the whole fault surface and then if you have a set of laboratory cores for which you have been able to measure the permeability, you can relate that property to the actual rock permeability and sort of then determine empirical uh, mathematical relationships that allow you to predict the permeability. Now, this may work well in contexts in which there's a high density of data at the reservoir level, but for CO2 storage, we're interested in moving to different settings in um, um, a lot of cases in aquifers that haven't necessarily been studied for oil and gas. And also, we are interested in, in studying the migration or the potential vertical migration from the storage interval up to the surface. So, um, <clears throat> there's a number of shortcomings in this sort of methodology. Um, one of them is that the SGR does not represent an appropriate description of the smearing process in this type of sediments. One big thing is that we fail with this method to account for the material heterogeneity, which in this type of faults is very, is very important. When you go to the field and you look at these faults, you can see um, 
a lot of heterogeneities in the material distribution. It's and so an averaging process is not really representative of that. Um, these uh, type of algorithms, because the interest was only on cross fold flow, do not model uh, flow along the fold. So that's also something that we need. Um, and in addition to using geometry, um, it's been shown or said in, in recent reviews that including material properties will improve the predictions of probability. And then we also want to be able to quantify the uncertainty in our predictions. If I tell you that the probability is, uh, I don't know, uh, one really does, but I don't tell you how much confidence I have in this value of probability, it's not going to be very useful anyway. So um, this is what we got out of this process. So this is sort of the, frame, the workflow of, of the algorithm that we developed. The idea is that we require the user to pass six parameters that will summarize the stratigraphy that we have. These parameters include, for example, the thickness of different layers, the cliff fraction, uh, the deep angle of both the fold and the layers, and then two parameters that um, summarize the boreal history of the sediments. Based on these parameters, which we try to limit to make it, uh, well, to make it that as many people as possible could, could actually use it, so you don't need a lot of detailed information of your basin to actually know this. Um, we quantify a set of intermediate geological variables, which are treated as random variables in our model, which are uh, functions of uh, these input parameters. No? And so to define um, how these functions um, uh, well, were modeled, we did a lot of uh, background research. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, um, there's uh, compilations of fault thicknesses and how they scale with fault displacement. So we are able to uh, define a probability distribution that takes into account the uncertainty and that relationship of increasing fault thickness with fault displacement. Um, and then, I don't know, for the permeability of the clay layers, for example, we can relate the compaction curve based on depth to the porosity of clays at different depths. And then if we know the clay fraction of our layers plus this uh, resulting porosity, um, there's been work done in the laboratory uh, to develop uh, relationships that are able to uh, give the permeability of a given clay material um, as a function of the, the porosity, the void ratio, um, and, uh, and the clay fraction. So this allows us to define a set of marginal probability distributions that then we will use for sampling. In addition to that, we also take into account uh, the dependency that can exist between some variables. So, for example, porosity and permeability may be um, correlated, um, or the residual friction angle, and then how continuous the material will be inside the fold will also be correlated. So, um, we used uh, some uh, statistical modeling techniques to be able to sample, draw samples, accounting for those dependencies. Now, all of these uh, or the samples for these for these materials allow us to place um, a set of materials in in the fold. And initially, this is going in two dimensions. Uh, so we have vertical vertical cross sections along a stripe. So this is modeled in x and z directions. And this allows us to determine for a given realization what is the thickness that a given clay smear should have, how continuous it should be, and what is the permeability that we're going to assign to each different materials in the fold. What we do is we combine a set of uh, sequences along a strike and to know how many sequences and uh, how that rela relates to the length of the fold. We use the a set of experiments conducted by uh, Rice Group, the ones, the sandbox experiment that I showed at the beginning, where they excavated the clay, the clay smears, and so we were able to use that data to sort of define how much clay smear segment along a strike. And this allows us to compose a three-dimensional volume, which we call the three-dimensional fault zone, with the materials populated in it. This would be one realization. And then we use that distribution of materials and single-phase fault simulation in, in the different directions uh, along a strike, across the fault, and then up deep to determine the upscale permeability at the resolution that the user has asked us to. And then this process is repeated uh, thousands of times, so this is pretty fast because this is single-phase fault simulation. Um, and we are able to obtain a probability distribution. So the first thing that we did was try to validate this methodology using um, some experimental data. In this case, ideally we wanted field data, but um, the highest quality data that we could access, at least right now, was in, in the laboratory. Um, 
And so here you have a summary of the experiments that I was talking about before with uh, a basement or a basal plate that can be displaced and then this can generate um, faults in the overlying stratigraphy. So these are a set of experiments that they did um, at Aachen University and they were able to not only generate these faults but then by changing the hydraulic head in the bottom layer they can induce flow across the fault and then we took these um, flow measurements and estimated the equivalent permeability of these faults on from them and compare that to our predictions, which I will show next. But before that, uh, so here there's a view of these excavated clay smears. So in blue, you can see the background sand, which has been um, dyed to sort of differentiate it from the clay. And you can see that, well, um, even if you're displacing a, a, a pure clay layer, that's not going to necessarily be continuous along the fault surface. So it, you can have like holes. Uh, through which a potential fluid could migrate. And then for a shorter length, so maybe like representative of this, this is the representation in our algorithm where you can see that indeed there are some holes also uh, over there. And here essentially you can see the summary of, of these uh, experimental results in the main plots. So these are for a case in which they displaced um, one clay layer sandwiched between two sand layers, and then in this case they had two clay layers in the middle. So we represented that in our algorithm and, uh, well, not the first time we did it, but after some work, we were able to match sort of these fragmentabilities by adjusting uh, parameters such as the fragmentation of the smears and so on. So here essentially is the, the two experiments of the multiple that they did in each, in each type of sandbox. We took the limiting ones, the ones that gave us the widest bounds in terms of permeability, and then, uh, well, tried to uh, see if our predicted probability distribution gave us most of the probability and the probabilities that actually were measured in the, in the laboratory. So after that, uh, we applied this algorithm to a set of different sequences um, to try to understand how this permeability resulting from the modeling of clay smears changes with different proportions of clay in the stratigraphy, different, different depths, and so on. And here I have two sort of n-member cases. In, in one case, I have a clay pore sequence. So what you see here in colors, more orange type colors, are sand layers. And then more darker brown is clay-rich layers. Uh, the threshold that which we consider something to be a layer that can contribute as near to the fault is a minimum of 0.4 or 40% of clay uh, material. Um, in this case, and so you can see that in the case in which we have relatively thin um, clay layers that are not dominant in sequence, uh, we get, well, smears that are very fragmented in a case in which you have like very thick layers and where clay is most of the, of the sequence, we get much more continuous uh, clay within the fold and this will result in probability distributions weighted towards much lower permeabilities compared to the, to the initial case. So here I don't have it, but um, in, in several cases in which we're modeling sequences with intermediate contents of clay, um, what we see is that some realizations will lead to very low permeabilities and some others higher permeabilities. Um, and what, this is essentially a, a reflection of our inability to ascertain what the given permeability will, will be. But, um, and directly what is sort of showing is that some realizations will allow uh, continuous conduits through sand material um, within the fault zone and some others will not. Um, so we get multi-model probability distributions. So the conclusions of this work is that um, in some cases, I didn't show it here, but it's what I was trying to, to mention now, uh, for probability distributions can be multi-model due to the existence of both holes in the clay smear. Uh, we also see that fault probability is controlled by the clay smear arrangements and continuity in the fault core, and this has been very well related to the experimental results that we, that we saw. Um, the code uh, provides a parameter-based link between the stratigraphy, the heterogeneous fault core materials, and the microscale permeability, which is something that with the other type of algorithms like the SGR and, and so on, you don't really have. You don't know um, what is the material distribution that will um, give you a certain permeability. Um, so that, that link is not really there. Um, and then we are able, as I said before, to quantify the likelihood of different low probability scenarios, which is required to assess hazard in such surface technologies like uh, geological carbon sequestration. Um, 
And yeah, so I didn't mention it here, and I think it's I wrote code to be released, but the code uh, we just made it public. So if someone is interested in modeling probability of faults, um, let me know. And there's some examples in the repository already, but uh, yeah, I I'm gonna be very very happy to talk about it. Okay, so that's uh, the end of the first project, and now I'm gonna talk about the second one that I wanted to show today. So in this case, what we wanted to do is to assess the viability of CO2 storage in offshore formations of the Gulf of Mexico at a scale that is relevant for climate change mitigation. And just as a refresher, uh, relevant for climate change mitigation, I mean that in a given field that we will be studying, we are injecting um, the order of megatons of CO2 per year. So um, the main goal that we had with this project, which was uh, sort of uh, commissioned or asked to us by, by ExxonMobil, um, was to assess the impact of having uh, wells in different locations in the field. Uh, in particular, when you have wells uh, close to faults or when you have them like farther away from, hole, from faults, uh, when it comes to the core pressure change and potential flow leakage. Um, what we're going to do is uh, couple the uh, flow and geomechanic simulations. Uh, for this project, uh, we did one-way coupling, which means that you run the multi-phase flow simulation first, and then you take the pressures and you do the uh, geomechanic simulations to determine the effective stresses and the influence of displacement and so on at their time step. But the influence of mechanical deformation on the core pressure change is not taken into account. Um, however, you can still uh, see the effects of the core elastic deformation and particularly in terms of comparing two scenarios since they are modeled with the same method, um, it's, still, it's still valid. So what we see is that uh, the low permeability faults that we have in this model um, prevent upwards leakage of CO2 from the injection interval. And then that the hazard of induced seismicity is very much controlled by the choice of the injection location with respect to the pre-existing, and in this case, low permeability faults. So we conclude that uh, large-scale CO2 injection in the Gulf of Mexico is feasible, but, um, well, so attention needs to be devoted to selecting uh, properly not only the site, but the place for the injectors as well. So this is what I'm going to try to show next in more detail. So um, as I said, uh, we worked in collaboration with ExxonMobil, so they uh, provided us with data for a given field in, in this Miocene section of the Gulf of Mexico. So this is New Orleans and Houston is over here. Um, so it's offshore, but in the relatively sort of shallow water uh, area of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and we have a structure uh, with a set of uh, porous sand zones and then thick cap rocks and uh, these normal uh, least big faults that are very typical of this area in the Gulf of Mexico. So this site would be uh, representative of how a given storage site in the, in the Gulf of Mexico will, will look like. Um, and so what we're going to do here is assess uh, long-term CO2 storage and fault leakage potential and uh, fault stabilization due to the injection operation. Okay, so this is a cross-section uh, through our model, um, where you can see in, in yellow the sand, the, the aquifer uh, intervals where that are potentially suitable to inject CO2. In this case, we chose this one, um, a normal fault, uh, which is this one over here in the domain, and then uh, whatever you see in gray is low probability uh, shale type of rock. Um, so. And then here, there's a map of the storage aquifer thickness. So you can see that the aquifer is, yeah, is a lot thicker on the southern part of the field than it is on the northern part of the field. So we have a domain size of, or initially we were given a domain size of 25 by 27 by 6 kilometers, because the faults in this case are essentially what the, limits the boundaries of this domain, and we didn't want to have the, the influence of boundaries so close. We extended this to about 40 kilometers in each horizontal dimension. Uh, which is the definitive match that, that we used and that I will show when I show the results. Um, what we do here in order to be able to work with the mechanics uh, simulator, in this case, we use Pilot. Maybe some of you are familiar with it for the mechanics. So it's a finite element code. And uh, we need to model the faults as two dimensional surfaces. And we use tetrahedra to model this domain uh, to be able to adapt to this uh, sort of complex geometry defined by the fault. And then we apply a, a trick in the, in the flow simulator, which is to, even though we have this mesh defined with faults as to the surfaces, um, 
We then modify the computational elements for the flow simulator to be able to define a given thickness and a given pore volume of each fault surface. Um, so the mesh is pretty big for the mechanics, it's about 40 million elements, but as you will see for the multi-phase flow simulation, we uh, sort of set all the cells that correspond to shale uh, layers as inactive, and we reduce significantly the number of elements. So for the fault properties, uh, it would have been great to sort of apply the algorithm that I just showed, but because this was developed at the same time and the algorithm was not ready, uh, here we used a sort of um, uh, industri industry default method, which is the uh, SGR mapping and then uh, modeling of permeabilities based on, on, a, on an empirical relationship. Um, due to the large displacements of these faults and the thick uh, shale layers, we end up with uh, predictions of permeability that are pretty low. So the highest permeability that we uh, get across these faults is about the order of 10 to the minus 2 million Darcy's, um, uh, which is about uh, 10 to the minus 17 meters square. So, um, and yeah, uh, essentially the message here is that we uh, see that faults in this, in this area are in principle very low uh, permeability, which will have important effects not only when it comes to CO2 migration, but also in how the pressure uh, will change as a response to, to injection. Um, the capillary pressure in the faults is determined based on a reference curve that we have for shales in the Miocene section of the Gulf of Mexico. This, this is uh, public information, it's from the Gulf of Mexico Atlas that was published by the uh, University of Texas Austin in 2017. And then what we do is uh, that reference curve is given for a, well, we, we do by averaging a set of cores. So we also know the permeability, the intrinsic permeability and the porosity of those cores. And then we're able to, um, for all the cells that we have in our fault, um, to relate and to determine the corresponding capillary pressure curve by using the actual permeability and porosity of our fault, and then the reference properties from the reference curve and so on. Um, this is don't use leverage uh, scaling, probably some of you are familiar with it. Um, and then uh, each curve that you see here essentially represents a different, a different location style in the fault. What this means is that as you decrease the permeability, the capillary pressure curve and the capillary entry pressure at when the water saturation is maximum will increase. So the entrance of uh, the non-wedging phase, which in this case is the CO2, is going to be more and more difficult. Um, all right, so then uh, for the two-phase uh, flow properties, um, well, I, I guess the, the main message that I wanted to give here is that uh, the total number of active cells uh, is reduced from 14 million to about a bit more than 3 million cells for the multi-phase flow simulation. As we said, inactive, uh, those uh, shale layers, uh, but of course, for the mechanics simulation, you need to have the whole, the whole mesh. Um, and then we have a few wells at two different locations that I will show next. Uh, so we're injecting about one megaton for each of these wells, which corresponds to a total of two and a half megatons of CO2 per year in this location. We inject over 50 years. Um, and then the total simulation time is five, 500 years. And we're going to be looking at things such as pore pressure change in the faults and then potential CO2 migration. Um, then another thing is that uh, for the boundary conditions of the flow model, um, there's uh, different strategies that one can use, but one of the simplest that still is able to um, uh, represent the effect of aquifer support in terms of how the pressure changes as a result of injection or completion of the reservoir is to use pore volume multipliers. So what you do is you take the, the cells at the boundaries of your domain uh, and you multiply them by a very large number. You can do some sensitivity analysis to check how large this number can be. Um, and then uh, that sort of represents and is able to account for this for this effect of, of aquifer support. So here I have a couple of videos. So what I will show first is uh, okay. So yeah, we don't have the videos. Well, so I'm just going to try to describe it. Okay. So um, this uh, is the two sort of injection scenarios that I was talking about at the beginning. So we have uh, one set of injectors that are in the open part of the domain, uh, relatively far from the fault, and especially with a lot of pore volume available. And another set of uh, injectors that are sort of contained between the large, uh, the large uh, faults in the domain, which have, as I showed before, low permeability. So what we observe is that when we inject here, the plume uh, sort of starts to migrate uh, northwards. Uh, if you remember the, 
bit of this aquifer is uh, something like that. So you know that the CO2 is less dense than the water. It will go to the top of the reservoir and then it will start to migrate due to gravity to the top of the formation. And then it gets relatively close to this area with the faults. Um, but due to the deep of these layers, um, when you stop injecting, it actually never gets in contact with the faults here. Uh, in the other case, it's very different. So the CO2 um, quickly starts to expand. And then we see that there's some uh, contact with this fault for these two injectors and contact with this fault for this injector. And uh, in some cases, the CO2 plume is able to cross the fault and it appears uh, on the other side or on the other compartment of the storage formation. So then the question is to look at the inside the fault and see what happens in terms of CO2 saturations and whether this is also going backwards or, or not. So I will show that. I think that's not a video, that's a fewer. So we'll be able to look at it. Uh, the pressure um, is the second set of videos, which I'll, also I, I'm not able to show. Um, so here what we see is that uh, when we're injecting in the open uh, part of the aquifer, the pore pressure is able to diffuse um, quite uh, fast and it, it uh, doesn't really, or the pore pressure change the way it gets to the faults. It gets to faults uh, with uh, pretty low magnitudes compared to the second case in which we were sort of very compartmentalizing between these faults. Um, as I introduced at the beginning, you can expect that this will have a uh, well, significant influence when it comes to the, the potential destabilization of the fault, which is something that I'm going to show next. And um, essentially in these videos, what you would see is that um, as we start injecting, there's a relatively um, a circular uh, increase of the, of the pore pressure, um, but that is very limited or very controlled by the geometries that we have for these for this faults. And so here you would see a much lower intensity of the red color. Here you would see much higher intensity of the red color since we use the same, the same color bars. So here we see an overpressure of almost uh, seven megapascals, mega which is quite a bit at this depth. In this case, I think the maximum is only one or so. But we're, we're going to be able to see more in detail later. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are some snapshots of what I was mentioning before, of how the CO2 bloom in the first injection scenario in the upper part of the domain doesn't really get, uh, um, uh, or doesn't really cross uh, the faults, but in the second case, we do observe that cross-fault uh, migration when the storage aquifer layer is sort of juxtaposed at the side of the fault. Um, and then to quantify the effect of, of the CO2 injection on fault stability, what we do is uh, quantify the color failure function and the changes in this color failure function. I know that many of you are probably familiar with it, some others may not be. So essentially what you're doing here is you try to uh, compute the balance between the shear stresses, which are always uh, positive, uh, and so destabilizing, and then the changes in the uh, effective, effective normal stress acting on the fault as a result of this uh, injection that increases the pressure and so, well, decreases the effective stress in a com positive compression sign convention, but I think these equations are written with the sign convention that Pilot uses, which is the opposite, is positive tension. And then, um, essentially, the thing that you have to remember to interpret these figures is that positive changes in this flow failure function will indi indicate fault destabilization, and that negative will indicate stabilization of the faults. As a reminder, the two scenarios that we are considering and plotting here is the first one in the open part of the domain, the second one in the closed uh, part of the domain. And here, what I'm going to be showing is the core pressure changes. So remember that this goes into the effective stress. This is for the first scenario, this is for the second scenario, and then the changes in the pool of failure function, which as you can see is also a function of other things, but at least in this scenario, it's very much dominated by the core by the pressure change. So, um, so this is the pressure change and the delta where exactly in its language? So, no, no, so we're taking the 98% So we take all the cells in the fold and then we plot the 98% up. So it's, it's on the fold? Okay. Yes, yes. So um, what you can see is that uh, there's a significant difference. Uh, I guess it's like a, at least an order of three or so uh, difference between the two scenarios. So um, we may not know how close these faults are to failure at the beginning. You can estimate it based on the state of stress, but you never know exactly how close the fault is to failure. But what you do know is that between those two um, um, setups, uh, you definitely would choose the first one. And so that tells us that uh, injecting close to low permeability faults is probably not a good idea. Even though the CO2 may not leak, um, you could potentially trigger seismicity much, much quicker. 
So um, this is a snapshot of the port pressure change of the first and the second scenario. Um, we saw that no CO2 leakage occurs after 450 years. So that's 450 years after the end of injection, which lasts for 50 years. Then uh, the connectivity uh, of the storage aquifer, essentially the port volume that you have available, uh, controls a lot the reservoir port pressure buildup. Mm -hmm. And uh, larger scale CO2 injection in the Gulf of Mexico is feasible, but uh, you have to be able to, or you have to do a proper analysis of what location you're going to choose and where in this location you're going to place your injectors. Um, that's all. Thank you for, for your attendance today. And uh, yeah, if there's questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, any questions? From the... Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the very nice talk. Thanks, Sonia. I have uh, I have two questions. So one is uh, about your first topic. Yeah. So you talk about this algorithm that is implemented in the the code that I understand it's called Predict. Yeah, the code is called Predict. Yeah. It's, uh, well, the name is because uh, uh, probability distributions of place near faults, and then we chose an acronym that. Uh, it's a it's a nice name. Yeah. And it works. <laughs> And so you said that this this would be available. Uh, yes. So the, yeah. So this is on GitHub. Um, it's on GitHub. Yeah. So um, when I was preparing these slides, I still haven't put it. So that's why I wrote it like that. But uh, yeah, today I wanted to change it, but then I, I never got to it. So that's on github.com slash elsalo slash edit. Okay. Yes. Then the idea of that is that you you have many many realizations yeah. at the end, and then you you can use that in your yeah. So then. I mean, you need to use judgment on how you choose from those distributions, right? So if you have a setup in which you are able to run uh, a lot of flow simulations, like a probabilistic type of uh, approach, you can just sample from those distributions, right? But if, if, you, if you can do that, and a lot of cases, a lot of times in multi-phase flow simulation, we can do that, then you have to think a little bit how you're going to choose. So you can get, yeah, I mean, you could choose bounds, you could choose like the modes of the distributions, right? There's, there's different things that you can do, yeah. Yeah. And, and then about the, the second topic, so the, the I was probably distracted. So in the end, the, what you observed, which was kind of predictable, is that if you have your wells outside of the falls zone, yeah, yeah. you are safer from the seismic point of view. Yeah. But if you put the wells inside your in the falls, you are safer from the leakage, at least the, the lateral leakage from point of Yeah, so you will get, in principle, less CO2 migration. That's um, as long as the faults don't move, right? Uh, if you activate the faults, and we have seen that if you inject between a uh, close compiler and between faults, you can increase the port pressure significantly and potentially get closer to, to fault slip relatively quick, then um, we are not modeling how the permeability of fault changes as a result of slip. So, so what we're saying here is, uh, you know, be careful if you have low permeability faults. Do not, do not. I mean, give some distance between the injectors and those faults. Even though, from a, an initial evaluation, we would say that leakage will not occur. But yeah. you know, from the, the but in the end, it's very difficult to, to. So, what would you suggest to the company? Because from one point of view, I would say put the wells outside. Yeah, yeah. So I. Mean, it's difficult to say in general what you would do in this specific setup. I think that it's better to inject. Far from the faults because the storage aquifer is still for keeping, right? So it will not go outside of the of that gap until you fill it. So I would probably inject far from the faults, and then of course you're limited in the total volume um, when you start to get close to. The and then there is always another boundary somewhere. So yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So I mean, um, there's to go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so you have to you have to think about this, but I, I agree with you. It's not an easy question to answer and. And probably here we're only taking into account the faults and the injectors. In a real field, you will have old wells, you will have other closures, you will, you will have maybe areas of the reservoir where the permeability is a lot better than in others, right? So you will have to take into account a lot of other. Um, but as always, you always try to sort of simplify the problem uh, to be able to give an answer, right? And then that's, yeah, that's what I can say here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, Victor has raised his hand. <laughs> so, I suppose. <laughs> Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yeah, I have. Well, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. I have several questions. I try to be short. But you, you were talking about the permeability enhancement as the four reactivates. So yeah. I was wondering if, with predict, you have considered this. Yeah. Uh, no. So we we are not considering this uh, right now. We we first uh, sort of focused on. Uh, trying to get a representative of fold materials and as a result of permeability that is realistic in this context and uh, considering the effects of uh, fold sleep on the permeability change no, as a result of the, fun, of the effective stress and then of, of sleep is definitely something that I would like to look at, but we haven't done it yet, no. And have you looked at the capillarity properties? So you were looking at permeability, but uh, yeah. in the context yeah. of C2 storage, if CO2 reaches the fold, it's important yeah. to know. Uh, yeah, so, so actually for, for capillary pressure and relative uh, permeability, I'm working on it right now using PREDICT to see how this will change in, in a fault uh, that we're looking at in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, PREDICT right now only, only gives you the intrinsic permeability um, because as you know then when you start to look at uh, multi-phase flow properties, um, the upscaling is is not very well defined, and there's I mean there's different options that you can do. You can do like a full simulation. You can take um, steady state uh, type of solutions to upscale, but uh, it's something that requires quite a bit of thought. Of thought, and as of as of right now, Predict doesn't have it, but it's certainly something that we that we're planning to look at. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting thing to look at. So you you were showing some lab experiments that measure the the permeability yes. due to the shearing. Is there any measuring for two-phase flow? Is there so, any kind of experiment? I haven't seen it in this type of sandbox models. Um, so the, the thing that we're trying to, or that you would need to account for is like, how is this low permeability materials is distributed within the fold, right? And then what that means for um, the potential connectivity, because if you're imagining that we're or in the lab, or in reality, or in a model, you will be able to represent them at a much higher resolution that you can in a simulation model, um, right? So if you imagine that the given grid block in your simulation model has at least 10 meters of, of, of length, and in this fold, we're discretizing things with uh, most one meter uh, in each dimension. Um, it's actually not uh, straightforward to, to, like, to decide how the, the capillary entry pressure and the, the well, the, the, these multi-phase four properties will be will be defined at the scale that you need them for a reservoir simulation. So, but the thing that you would need to account for is like how the clay smears are distributed within the fold, right? Imagine that you have one clay smear that is very thin, but is completely um, across your your fold zone. Even though the proportion of this material will be very low, you will still get if you're upscaling that as a single grade block, you would still need to. Uh, get a very low capillary pressure, right? So things like that is what, uh, what we're starting to think about. And um, yeah, I think I haven't seen anything in the context of these sandbox models, but also I should say that I've been very focused on intrinsic permeability for now. So I, I don't think I can say that I looked uh, um, thoroughly at the, at the literature um, for, for this. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and just a, a, final, a final curiosity, uh, so for this, the, the model that you have shown in the second study, yes, uh, Gulf, of, Gulf of Mexico, um, have you used PREDICT to estimate the permeability of the faults? No, oh, I'm sorry because I can't answer not to all of your questions, but uh, we, have, we haven't done it. So, so this was a project that had a rather, um, how should I say, not short, but like we had a timeline for this and Josimar was working on this at the same time that I was developing pretty so so it did not make it there but I can say that in another injection model that I'm preparing and should be available you know in the next year or so we will use predict to model leakage uh, in this type of faults so okay thank you very much yeah thank you Victor okay um, I, I would just like to uh, 
else. One question also. Yeah, yeah. Is it, but also about this model predict? Yes. The code, the, the, the processes that it simulates, does it also the deformation, let's say? The no. Is, is that model explicitly or no. is it just the uh, so, start with the yeah, so we're we're not accounting for the for the shear slip of the faults. We're not it's not a physics-based code in the sense of modeling fault slip. So we started from from the field and lab lab tests, and we said, okay, how do this fault loop? And then we tried to um, do it in a way that we'd be able to account for uncertainty, but we didn't go into modeling the the shear deformation because that well that requires a set of other things that. Uh, yeah, it's it's more. I mean, the statistics are founded on domain knowledge, right? So we did that in, in collaboration with a structural geologist at ExoModel, who has been working on fault seal for most of his career. So I mean, we did that thinking about how we were doing it, but we are not we are not simulating the process of. Uh, okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the first question is, uh, uh, how did you uh, collect the data from MESCO, uh, the cost of MESCO? For the cost of? Like for, the, for, the, uh, for the loop of Mexico. Yeah. So we didn't collect the data. The data was given to us by ExxonMobil. Uh, you just uh, collected from the, the literature? So, so the structural model, yeah, where you yeah. saw the folds and the horizons, that was given to us by ExxonMobil, by a company. So they, they did, uh, they have a lot of seasoning reflection profiles and so on. Um, they regularly build these type of models for, well, production, storage, whatever it is that they are doing. And in this case, they share this model with us. And then we put these horizons and these folds to create our mesh, and then from there we went. For the porosities and permeabilities, we had uh, some well logs that they also shared with us for this area, so we were able to estimate those from, from that. And um, for the multi flow properties, then we estimated them as fast as we could. Is this just a random selection of uh, some place to? Yeah, so the idea was to have something that would have a set of structure and properties that is representative of the Miocene section of the Gulf of Mexico at large. So, as you know, um, I mean, in geology, you always need to be looking at the local properties. If you try to do something in general and don't look at the local, you're going to get it wrong, always. But um, we wanted to, to have something that was going to be representative of the type of structure that we see, um, and that would allow us to, to get some general conclusions. But uh, So that's how it was chosen. They, I don't know exactly what criteria they, they used, but we know that this is representative of the structure in this. Yes. Uh, another question is, uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, that the permeability, the default permeability, uh, keep constant or or they are change during the injection. No. So, so in these models, it doesn't change. So, so the permeability is a function of many things, and one is uh, effective stress. Um, but we we don't take. Like that's not included in the model that we're using right now. So, so the permeability is going to be the same always. And what we can tell is with this set of properties, what is the fault going to start to slip? Yes, so, but for the real case, uh, if you inject the CO2 into the fault, yes, but the, but if the it depends a bit on, on the saturation. So that's not taking. Well, I mean, so are you talk, So you're talking about the. Uh, the relative permeability and then the effective multiphasical permeability, or you're talking about the intrinsic permeability? Because the effect of saturation and how the effective permeability in the fault changes, yes, this we take into account. But we, what, we don't, what we don't include is the variation of intrinsic permeability, which is one of the two factors that go into your, your effective permeability, um, on, on like factors like effective stress, for example, or, or displacement. Does that, does that make sense or no? I don't think so. If the volume of the, the thought yeah. expands, yes. yeah. then the porosity becomes. Yes, yes. yes. So, I mean, you will have to change, right? But, but the idea is that, I mean, at least in this model, we're also not injecting in the fault. So, the CO2 is only getting there after. Well, in the, in the second scenario, no. In the second scenario, it's getting there quite close. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. I, I'm not saying that you know what we did is is uh, 100% accurate and correct. You 
you always have to make decisions, and for sure this is something that would be very interesting to see, but we didn't take it, it into account here. So. But, but in your geological model, I understand that those faults act more as a barrier to fall, to the yes. Fall, right? Yes. So uh, what's the, the intrinsic probability of, of those faults? Yeah, so it's uh, 10 to the minus 2 milligarcy is the highest point that we identified, but most of them is going to be Minus four, minus four. So it's my, my to They are less permeable than the reservoir? Yes. yes. So, so they, they are more as, bar as barriers? Yeah. So in this sense, you can consider that there's, I mean, the, 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 the pressure, the overpressure inside this force will be, I mean, it depends, but can some overpressure can get inside the fold, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, yeah, for sure there's more things to consider. Um, and uh, but in the end, you have to you have to take a decision because if we want to do anything, we would never finish. But uh, but yes, it, that would be interesting to see. Uh, one last question yeah, yeah. for for the topic two. Um, how did you how did you choose the location uh, for the injection for the scenario one? Um, so I think that uh, I mean the distance it, uh, between the boundary and the injectors. You did the well and the uh, fault. Yeah. yeah. So we took we took the midpoint between the boundary and the fault. I think. Uh, what what I mean is uh, only if you choose the uh, the distance for the outside case, uh, uh, it's comparable to the uh, the well for the inside case. If, no, if the distance is uh, comparable, then yeah. the uh, results you can, you can compare. Yes, I mean, it's true that uh, we could have taken like some average of distance between the folds and then place maybe this like closer. Is that's what, that's what you mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then here in the open part, um, yes, maybe we could have done that, but uh, essentially, I guess the goal was to show like, when you have the injectors far from the fault, and when you have them in a compartment that is limited by fault. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, there, there could have been some other criteria to choose the, the, the location of the, of the injectors, and maybe for, for the comparison of uh, the pressure buildup, uh, like how much more does it increase in the compartment compared to like outside? It's it's true. I agree with you. Maybe something like this would have. Would have why, why didn't you put the the wells uh, closer to the fort for the scenario one? This one? Yeah. Well, because I, we already have one case in which we're injecting very close to the faults, right? So here, what we want to see is how how or we want to compare these two cases and see. Okay, if we have uh, in an open uh, part of the reservoir, how much less or how much better it is when it comes to the port rendering increase. So, so that's why we did it here, uh, and yeah, I don't think there was any quantitative criteria to choose the location of these of these points. I, I can ask Josimar, but I, I don't think we did anything like that. We selected something that was going to be representative of an open compartment, and there's other options that you could have chosen, and then another one that was uh, represented from close compartment between non permeability faults. So if you could, if you would have had the injectors here, you probably would have observed some similar things, um, and these injectors could have been somewhere else. But yeah, that's that's what we chose. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's it. No okay. questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So we uh, leave it. Yes, and thank you for the speaker, and thank you for the attending. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thanks uh, for those of you that were online. Um, I hope that you heard as well, and um, yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, um,